name is Mike, and I'm the site pastor for our South Naperville location here at Trinity. Thanks so much for joining us for worship this weekend. It's an honor to spend time in God's Word with you. Now, we're going to be in the second week of our Reopening Christianity series today. And, you know, Reopening Christianity is kind of an inside joke between us. We believe the Word of God never really shut down during the COVID-19 quarantine, even though we had to shut down our indoor, in-person worship for a while. And, you know, six months ago, we really wouldn't even have considered calling it that, would we? But the good news is we get to resume that next month in October. All four of our locations are going to be worshiping indoors in person again, albeit with COVID-19 restrictions and masks and social distancing and all that. But thanks be to God, we get to be in person again. It's still kind of a joke, though. Christianity never really closed its doors. The good news of Jesus never stopped its work. And I'm so thankful for God for our congregation's ability to do that during the quarantine, aren't you? Hey, today, we're going to be talking about the life and ministry of a special lady in the church. Her name is Tabitha. She had this Jewish name, Tabitha, and she also had a Greek equivalent of that name being Dorcas. And we know that that had implications for her life and ministry because she served not only her own people, the Jews, but also Greeks. She was an exemplary disciple. She gave of not only her money, and we don't know whether she was rich or poor or somewhere in between, but she also gave her time making clothing to give away to other people. In fact, we believe that she might have been a widow. She was ministering to widows at the time of the story we're about to engage in here in Acts chapter 9. But what I wanted to share with you is just a snapshot of the spirit of God at work in the life of Tabitha in this way. Take a look at this scripture from Colossians chapter 3, and maybe this will set the tone for the event that we're going to study in Tabitha's life. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Now, you could look at the life and the ministry of Tabitha as an early church disciple there in the first century, following Jesus even after his ascension into heaven, and look at this scripture and say, you know what? She was really a great example of this. But yet, Tabitha found herself sick and dying. And as we pick up this event in the scripture, we've actually found that Tabitha died from some illness we really don't know anything about. But we find her clothed in a burial shroud instead of in the good works that she did. In fact, the Bible says she was full of good works. She was complete and perfect in good works. Yet we find her having passed away in this story. And the sadness of this sets us up for great joy to come. You may know that the Apostle Peter was called in to see Tabitha's body. And as we get ready to engage in what he did next and the miracle he did next, we want to be open to the way that God may be calling us in the church as we re-enter indoor worship and re-engage in relationships that have been strictly online for the past several months and take inventory of the way God would have us re-enter and re-engage those relationships. I want to share with you a, a potential stumbling block for us. This comes from the heart and the writings of Martin Luther. Here's what Luther writes. He says, if you possess faith, your heart cannot do otherwise than laugh for joy in God and grow free, confident and courageous. For how can the heart remain sorrowful and dejected when it entertains no doubt of God's kindness to it and of his attitude as a good friend with whom it may unreservedly and freely enjoy all things. Such joy and pleasure must follow faith. If they are not ours, certainly something is wrong with our faith. Now I want to ask you a question. How has your stress level been over the past few months? I know that as we engage in e-learning in three different levels of public school in my household, elementary, middle, and high school, Tensions can be a bit high. 
people driving around these days and re-engaging in work and, and in business relationships and going back to lunch again, find themselves on the edge emotionally and spiritually. It doesn't take much now for a lit fuse to turn into an emotional explosion. Now this characterizes us in the church as well, and that's okay because after all, we're just regular people too, aren't we? We're not holier than somebody else. The Holy One has called us to follow Him, and so we trust in Him, and His holiness is poured out upon us in the eyes of God. We're not perfect, and we don't have to be, but God has called us to be Jesus in the world, to clothe ourselves with Christ, and yet at times, even before COVID-19, we tended to look inwardly and to cater to our wants and needs instead of looking outwardly to the way God might be calling us to engage in the world. Now, maybe as we read through this text from Martin Luther, maybe you thought for a minute, you know, I don't feel very joyful right now. I don't feel like I'm taking much pleasure in many relationships right now. You know what? Rest assured in the peace of Jesus, there's a reason for that. And that reason will make itself clear in the next few minutes. I love this quote from uh, the namesake of Martin Luther, and this would be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said this, he said, if today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, think about Peter, Tabitha, the way they served and the way they worked together. Uh, Martin Luther King says, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. We could caveat that by saying the 21st century now. And the same warning applies for us. We have the opportunity to serve each other and the community in an unprecedented way in the next few months. And yet the temptation will be to turn inward, to become sour, to become consumeristic, and to turn away from the work of the Spirit of God. You know, when I was in college some years ago, I had a favorite go-to meal. I also worked full-time along with taking a full load of classes at school, and I was in a band and had some friends I hung out with as well on the side. So I was a busy guy. I was single, lived in an apartment. And so when I'd get home after the end of a super long day, one of my go-to meals was chili spaghetti. Now, I didn't realize that this had an official name in culinary circles. It's called Cincinnati chili. Basically, it's just chili on spaghetti noodles with cheese and other toppings on it. So what I would do is I would mix up some spaghetti noodles, and I'd find the cheapest chili in the store I could and just heat that up and dump it on those spaghetti noodles, and then I'd slather it with sour cream and cheese and all kinds of stuff, and then I'd wolf that down, and then I'd have to lay down for about half an hour or more to recover from that meal. Now, even as I look at the picture of the chili spaghetti right now in front of you, it makes me a little ill in the tummy region. I would never eat something like this today because I'd have to lay down for more than 30 minutes to recover from that meal afterwards. As I've gotten older, my tastes have changed. My diet's changed. The stuff I buy at the store and use in my life has changed. The people that I've hung out with have changed. As someone who consumes things and takes things into my life and uses them for specific purposes, as someone who has engaged in multiple relationships in different ways, in different settings across decades of life, I know that as a consumer, as someone who engages in these activities, my tastes and needs and wants change. Now, maybe you feel the same as a consumer, consuming products, and working through relationships and jobs and school and all kinds of uh, challenges and difficulties and pleasures and joys. You know, something about us is always changing. Something about the heart is always changing. And we are tempted as a church to think about the church experience, the going to worship and being engaged with others in the church from a consumeristic point of view and how it can benefit me and what it can do to uh, add to or add value to my life. I'm tempted to, in those moments, become a spiritual consumer. And what this does is it messes with the very values and it messes with the very purpose that Christ has called me into, has called you into. Now here at Trinity, what's our purpose? 
It's to help people look, live, and love more like Jesus. And in doing so, we become more like Jesus ourselves. That's our vision, right? And our values include connecting, worshiping, serving, leading, sharing, being accountable, and being generous. You know, being a religious consumer of sorts goes against those values and turns me inward toward myself. In fact, there's another scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 where St. Paul talks about the idea of growing up in the faith. He says when you first come into the faith, life just comes at you and rocks you back and forth like wave after wave upon a ship that's being tossed here and there. And you find yourself in circumstances you can't control. But the good news is in Jesus that we are called to grow and to mature. And in fact, here's what that looks like. Paul says this in Ephesians 4, he says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We will vacillate around. We will swing around. We'll gather around the truth and speak that to each other in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who's the head of his body, the church. He makes this whole body fit together perfectly, perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, now catch that again, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that that whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I think about the human body and how it works and how if there's one part of it that fails, that falls apart or disengages from the rest of the body, it disrupts the working of the body. But when the body is working together and all is humming and the machine of the body is working well, then it gets up and it runs and it moves and it's motivated and it takes action. The same holds true for the body of Christ. It's the same body that when healthy, when all parts are serving together, reaches down into the death that has cursed us since the beginning of life on earth and brings new life into it. Here's what happened back to the story of Peter and Tabitha. Peter sent everybody out of the room, the scripture says. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows. Mark that. The widows she served directly by clothing and caring for called them into the room and presented her to them alive. My friend, there are some lessons to be learned from Peter's actions as God worked through him. Look at these key words. Peter prayed, and then he called his friend Tabitha, who he personally knew by name. He helped her get up. She had just been dead, and he helped her back to her feet and into a brand new life. And then he presented her to the rest of her people so that they could see the power of God at work. And as he re-engaged her life with her, he was being used by God to bring life into a dead situation. My friend, that is the work God has for you and me. As we reopen our doors, as we re-engage these relationships, as we go back in person, masked up and socially distanced, there is death out there in the spiritual world that God has called us to be a part of, bringing back to life. That is work only you can do in your life. Think about it this way. As we learn from Peter's example, there are four takeaways. One of them, we can pray. In a situation where we see death at work, despair at work, where we see people desperate for good news in a political climate that is just tearing families and relationships apart, where there's difficulty in the streets, people are losing jobs, where people are feeling stuck and shut in and their backs emotionally against a wall. We can pray. We can pray throughout our days, not just in the morning or not just at night or not just before meals. We can pray unceasingly, the scripture says, as we go. And then we can get to know our people, the people that God's brought into our life. We can call them by name and take them by the hand and offer personal help with prayer and with any other physical means. That might be a meal, it might be time spent with someone that we might not ordinarily spend time with. It might be doing something physical like helping a neighbor out in the yard, especially as we start getting ready to rake leaves and getting ready for winter and snow and all those good things. 
Who knows what the quarantine's going to look like in December? Have you even thought about Christmas yet? There's so many opportunities for us to put our hands in and serve the way Jesus serves. And lastly, as we do this, let's let God take those opportunities wherein we serve and share them so that the glory of God may be passed from person to person, from story to story, from opportunity to opportunity. You know, there's no better place to grow as a follower of Jesus than in a small group relationship. Now, you may know every year as we do our fall series, which starts in October, we get together in small groups and we enjoy the word of God together and we enjoy each other's company together as followers of Jesus. Here at Trinity, we believe that the small group is the number one most important and effective place to grow as a disciple of Jesus. I want to invite you today to remember the story of Tabitha, to remember Peter's role, how he reached into death and through the work of God brought a dead person to life. That is the work you are cut out for, my friend. So I'd invite you to do this. Go to the link that we put together to sign up for a small group and get ready to start meeting with a small group in October, even as we have the opportunity also to meet indoors for worship. Go to tlc4u.org slash groups and sign up for a group right away. Don't delay it. Don't put it off. October's coming soon. When you find yourself in a small faith family like a small group, God can grow you through prayer, through knowing and calling each other's names, through serving each other, and being a part of God sharing the good news of Jesus in a tangible way in your life. I'd ask you to join me in prayer as we close this message, and let us remember God has a place for us to contribute, each one of us, as the body of Christ, and there is no one who can do the contribution we were called to do for us. We are uniquely gifted to do that work. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We live in a world, God, that is dying to meet you, where people don't even know that, where people take the name of God in vain and aren't able to see, for some reason, the work of God around them. God, change that tide. Use me and use the people I will find in small group to change the tide around me as we enter back into in-person worship. Let us also enter into fellowship together, into a relationship that is more faith family than anything else. And let us be used of God to be activated in a world full of spiritual death so that people may see there is life in you. Use me, God. And as we continue now to pray and to gather together in song and in a time spent with you, motivate us, move us, God, to action. Let us follow you into this new season together. In your name we pray, and together we say, amen and amen.